Welcome. I'm glad you're joining me today where I'm going to share some more gospel with you, of course. And the topic I want to share to, today is critical, critical for your walk with the Lord and, and having a rich relationship with Him. It's so important to understand what I'm going to share today. And uh, you know, there are, amazingly, many Christians who don't know this. <laughs> You know, they don't, or they might just, they think it's not as important as it really is because if you don't understand these truths and hold them dear and close to your heart, you know, I mean, they're a foundation that you build your whole relationship with God upon, then you may get off track and your walk with the Lord may become difficult and, and frustrating. And this is so important to understand this. So I think it's, I'm just thrilled to be able to share this with you. And I'm praying that your hearts are open to hear exactly what I'm attempting to say. Praise God. So basically, in a nutshell, this whole teachings about the fact that the law has been abolished, has been done away with. And most Christians, they think, well, they just relate to God the way they did before they even trusted in Him, before they knew Jesus. And they just relate to Him based on their, their own knowledge of their good and bad behavior. And that's what you call being law-minded. It's, re it's very religious, and it's not the living way. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. He didn't say, you come to the Father, or you have a relationship with the Father by your own list of do's and don'ts, and what a good little Christian should do, etc., etc., and all that is noble, and as Paul even says, it's having a zeal for the Lord, but it's not according to correct knowledge. You know, it does sound so holy to say, let's, let's pursue God, let's seek Him with all our heart, and, and be sure that we're always doing what we're supposed to be doing. And it's all, the focus is not really on the Lord, but it really, in, in that mindset, it becomes, the focus gets to be upon you. And that's, of course, wrong. You don't want to be focusing on yourself. You know, in Hebrews it says, fix your eyes upon Jesus, not upon you. He is the author and finisher of your faith, right? Amen. So... The law, as it says in Galatians, which I'm about to read, is it was meant as a schoolmaster. That doesn't sound too pleasant, does it? I mean, you kind of get images. If you ever went to a private school in the old days, <laughs> they used to, what they would do, the schoolmaster or the, the teachers, if the student was out of line, they'd whack your knuckles and with a ruler and, and just treat the students really harshly when they got out of line. And that's what the law is really like. It's, it has no mercy. It has only straight lines. And if you get even a hair out of line, it doesn't grant you any grace or mercy. It says, you made a mistake. How could you? You know, that's the kind of uh, mindset a person has when they are law-minded because when they do get out of line because of their own human weakness they that's the voice that's the response they get is it, it doesn't congratulate you in other words for all the other things that you have been doing right what it, the law does is it it emphasizes where you're falling short fall as as it says you are fallen short from the glory of God and and the law literally is meant to reveal that to you and I have other teachings by the way that talk about 
what the law teaches you. It doesn't teach you holiness. And that's a mouthful right there. But what I want to focus on today is the fact that it's been done away with. You know, if you think about, we have a living relationship with God through Jesus. It's not based on rules and regulations. It's a, it's a friendly relationship. It's a familial, you know, we're, we're in a family of God. You know, it's not based on rules. It's based on he's our father and we're his children. And, or he's our husband and we're the bride of Christ, right? It's all relationship based. And when we think that God is, relates to us based on, well, he gets out his long list of good and wrong behavior and he checks you off on each one. Well, that doesn't really bring you to great endearment toward the Lord, right? I mean, actually, when you have that kind of mindset that that's how God is, it actually causes you to want to draw away from Him, get away from Him. <laughs> and, you know, that's what you think. That it, When you think incorrectly that that's how He's relating to you. Because that's what the law does. It actually pushes people away. It brings a dividing line, a wall of separation between you and God. Not because God's removed himself from you. Of course not. But it's in our own wrong mentality in that case. We incorrectly draw away from God when we're thinking like that. Because who wants to be in bondage to someone who's only out to point out your faults? And of course, God is not like that because of Jesus' finished work on the cross, right? So like I was saying, the law is your schoolmaster. It, it, until you received Christ, until you trusted in Christ, the law was meant to point out everything you did wrong. How lovely is that? <laughs> and so when we think that we still need to relate to God based on that, you know, this, this mentality that he's got a, you know, like they say about Santa Claus, you know, he's checking his list and marking him twice. You know, God's not like that. He's just interested, are you, in tr are you trusting in Christ? Well, that's about it. That's what his big focus is. It's not on you, it's on Jesus. And so when we think he has a list, though, it brings death to our relationship, right? It, it just brings guilt and condemnation, not a boldness to approach God and have a real friendly relationship with God through Jesus Christ, right? And just think of that. Well, let me read this verse here first. In Galatians 3, 23 through 25, it says, Before faith came, we were kept under guard by the law. For what, uh, I'm sorry, kept for the faith which would afterward be revealed. Therefore, the law was our tutor or our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor or we're no longer under the law. So after, after we've come to the end of ourselves through the law, when the law says, you don't do this right, you've fallen short of the glory of God, you're just a sinner. Because that's what the law reveals to you, is you fall short of the standard, the perfect standard of God. And when you realize that, hopefully, by a humble heart, and by the ministry of the Holy Spirit, you come to trust in Jesus. Amen. And so after that faith for Jesus has, has come into your heart, as it says right there, you are no longer under that tutor, that schoolmaster that just wants to whap you on the head whenever you do something out of line. Praise God. That's huge. This is huge. Because people... Many people in Christian circles, they think that God is leading and guiding you by uh, 
you know, whether or not you're doing something right or wrong. And that's not the living way. The living way is just letting Jesus minister his love and his acceptance and his righteousness as a gift to you. And then out that abundance of your correct knowledge of your identity in Christ, love just pours out. An effortless, holy walk with the Lord just is an effortless result of hearing this good news. Amen? So don't put the cart before the horse, as I say. You know, your walk with the Lord is not about your right doing. It's about you just receiving. It's all about receiving first what Jesus has done for you and continually receiving. And that out of the abundance of the heart that you're just filled with the, the revelation of His great love for you then that love just overflows and pours out unto other people, unto yourself, and it affects every area of your life. And that's what you call having a living walk with the Lord. It's not based on do's and don'ts. You're out from underneath that schoolmaster. You could say you graduated. Amen. You got the diploma. You are out of there. <laughs> Praise God, and, it, and that you know what's signed on that diploma it says done and performed and certified by Jesus Christ. Amen. You have been delivered out of that system, that law mentality, that system. And speaking of which, let me just mention Galatians 5 1 and well, I'm going to read a few verses here, I'm talking about being set free from the law. It says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. That's talking about the law. You know, you've been, once you come to this awareness that I'm not under the law, well, don't, don't follow the slippery slope where you can just slide right into being of that mentality again. Because human nature is like that. You know, that's how the, this whole world operates, really. You scratch my back, I'll scratch your back. You know, you do good and you get rewarded or promoted or you get that bonus. You know, just even in our families, a lot of times, we relate to each other, unfortunately, by how good you're acting. And so when we're surrounded in an environment that's like that, that's being law-based. You know, you re you're rewarded for good and you're penalized for doing wrong. Well, when we're surrounded with that kind of mentality, it's a s easy slope, slippery way to just fall right back into that thinking that is also how God relates to you. And that's not true. As it says right here, as I was saying here in Galatians 5.1, Do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. Indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. And again, I testify to every man who becomes circumcised, he is a debtor to keep the whole law. In other words, you can't be just pretty good and let me just, eh, I'll, I'll, I'll follow, follow and be the good little Christian to a certain extent. You know, I'll make sure I'm in church every Sunday. And, you know, you're focused on your works. Well, you know, if you're going to be focused on your works, as Paul says here, well, then do it all. Don't be a hypocrite and do just part of it. You know, if you want to be, have a law, be under the law, you know, based on being a good little Christian, well then make sure you do it all. You know, make sure that you give religiously all your tithes and all your offerings every week. And make sure you pray every night. And you know, whatever your big list of, well not even your list, because your list could be a lot shorter than God's list. <laughs> like that's the point I'm making here. You want to keep it all. You can't just keep your own little portion of what you think meets a good level of righteousness. 
that's what you call being having personal righteousness and that doesn't that's not sufficient in God's eyes you need God's righteousness and you may be thinking well how in the world am I gonna get God's righteousness well you know what you get as a gift it's a gift it's not based on your works that's the whole point of the gospel or a big big portion of it is that Jesus came and he made you in right standing or gave you a gift of righteous God's gift of righteousness so you're forever in right standing with him so don't revert back to your own personal righteousness your own personal right standing before God because it just it's like putting a limp in your step with God you now he's walking straight and he wants to take you long distances but you got this pebble I mean even a pebble in your shoe which is the law and don't you know even after half a mile you're gonna get a blister on your foot and da 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 I mean you can't walk well with the Lord when you're law minded it just causes your personal the richness of your personal relationship with God to suffer to really you'll feel a deficit for sure you feel a distance I mean if this is confirming witnessing with your heart at all well then it's like a, a red flag that you may be somewhat law-minded and I'm here to share with you to nip that in the bud and come to your senses and realize and be relieved and as it says here keep stand fast in that freedom that liberty that you've been given in Christ don't be tangled up in the law again don't be you know the, the, the teachers that teach the law or a mixture of the gospel and the law it sounds so cunning I mean it is cunning I guess that's probably because it's really it's what Satan uses to deceive you is basing your relationship on the law and that is not up to date it's been abolished so he brings this old doctrine to light well, so to say to light and misleads you thinking well your relationships based on that and, it, and you're it's not it just brings death to your relationship with God as it says in 2 Corinthians 3 9 I believe you know you have been set free from death I mean Jesus said I came to give you life and life more abundantly so don't listen to this message that brings death you know it's the enemy that comes to kill steal and destroy so definitely Satan is a messenger of the law <laughs> that's a powerful word because that's an old message you know in 2nd Corinthians 3 also it says we've been ordained as ministers not of the old covenant but of the new covenant God has not anointed Christians to preach unforgiveness and condemnation our message is all about you've been forgiven and you are in right standing now with with God through Jesus Christ so any other message that is not that is not the true message and who else would be the messenger Satan right Amen. so let's continue on here in Galatians so he said you gotta do all the law don't be deceived in thinking you gotta do just part of it as he said there in verse 30 you have become these people who were relying on their good actions trusting in their good works he said to them you've become estranged from Christ you who attempt to be justified by the law you have fallen from grace ouch did you hear that because so many people they think well I've fallen from grace if I've done this wrong and I did that wrong and you know I mean I could 
give some examples, but I don't want to talk about all that stuff. You know, I mean, they, they think, people think, that if I do wrong, well, that's what's falling from grace. Now, according to the Bible here, this is the definition of falling from grace. You attempt to be justified or in right standing with God based on your good behavior by the law. That's being good behavior minded. So keep that in mind. Who wants to fall from grace? Now, he's not saying, oh, you, you lost your salvation. No, no, don't, you know, don't think that. But the effect, the power that grace can have in your life is obsolete. It is extinguished when you are law-minded. You are like slamming the door shut. In, on, on God's power to work in your life when you are relating to Him based on your good behavior because He can only relate to you through one way and that's Jesus Christ who was full of grace not works and your works righteousness your good behavior but He was full of grace and truth Amen. So that's how we walk with the Lord. That's how we keep that door open. Because, you know, God is always pouring out His blessings. He doesn't ever shut the door. You shut the door through your own unbelief. So that's having the right perspective of God's goodness, is remembering that it's by grace that we're saved. That means his unmerited free favors are continually being poured out upon us, continually. But through unbelief and wrong, what I mean by that is it's wrong. It's wrong belief. You're, you're relating to God based on the law, basically. And that brings condemnation, which causes you to... That, you know, and say condemnation makes you feel guilty is to be, you know, accurate. Because everybody in Christ is free from all condemnation. That's the truth. Now, you may feel guilty because of your wrong mentality, but the truth is, is that you never are condemned in God's sight. So God sees you correctly, is my point. He sees you without condemnation, pure and holy, without blame, spotless, a shining, radiant bride of Christ. But if we don't understand that, and we think that our identity is changed whimsically according to how we're acting, well then that, like I said, this just totally slams the door shut from His grace working in your life. Amen. So that's why this is so very important, like I said at the very beginning, because if you don't understand that steering clear, I mean, running in the opposite direction from any inkling toward the law and being law-minded is so necessary for your spiritual well-being. For seeing the effectual working power of God's operative in your life. You know, it's so very important because God's power works in your life according to the knowledge, the correct knowledge that you have of God. It really does. God's provided everything, but if we don't think correctly, well then we're cutting off that supply through our own unbelief. That's the truth. That is the truth. So, <clears throat> let's get back to the drawing board here. I My whole point in this lesson is to emphasize that the law has been abolished. And as we read right there in Galatians, you know, don't be entangled again with the law. Well, how can we righteously say that? How can we say, well, the law has been done away with? Well, let's go to some of these verses here that repeatedly say that the law has been abolished, okay? We'll start here in 2 Corinthians 3.11. This is the Wesley translation. It says, 
For if that which is abolished or literally destroyed was glorious, and that's speaking of the law in context, the tablets of stone, the law that Moses carried down from Mount Sinai, much more that which remains or is permanent is glorious. And that's speaking of the gospel, the life of the Spirit, the new covenant that we're ministers of, which I just mentioned a moment ago. So that's the word that remains is the gospel and that's what we're called a minister and any other word quote unquote because it's not the word if it's not fully the gospel then it's not the word and it's a lie and that's why I said earlier Satan actually shares the law and brings guilt and separation through that old message to people by bringing a condemning, accusing message to them. And on the other hand, here that we're ministers of the gospel, we have come to know that the law has been abolished. It's no longer the correct message to listen to. You know, some people, they really hold dear the law. You know, I'm probably, I could be stepping on many toes in this message, but it's the truth. It's, it, it's for your own good that you come to the awareness that, that holding highly your idea of what excellent behavior should be and living by that causes you to be bitter, to be, you know, just, I can't for lack of a better word, shriveled up inside. You are not enjoying the abundant life that Jesus has come to give you. So believe this and, and be set free from that mentality that you are obligated to live a righteous life by your own efforts, so to say. You know, that's being law-minded. You've been delivered from that kind of lifestyle. Praise God. You know, Jesus came to set you free so that you can enjoy a, a rich relationship with Him that's not based on your actions. Praise God. And, and it's just, just to confirm that, just to assure your heart that this is not a lie. <laughs> This is really the truth, that you have been set free, for the law has been abolished. As it says in Ephesians 2.14, and this is speaking of the, the Jew and the Gentile becoming one new man in context. For he himself, Jesus, is our peace, who has made both one, and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances so as to create in himself one new man from the two thus making peace and i'm going to pause right there did you hear that i'm going to read a little bit further but that's just so powerful he's abolished the enmity that is the commandments you know what enmity means it means hatred so don't hold dear to your heart something that opposes you, That's, that is, it hates you. It's meant to bring you down, to beat you down so that you just feel like a mouse instead of having the boldness of a lion like Jesus said, the righteous are as bold as a, light, uh, a lion. You know, Jesus didn't say that. That's in Proverbs, I think. But that's the point is, is that when you realize... Rather you're, in, rather, you're in right standing with God, not because of what you do, but because of the gift of righteousness, well then, your whole walk with the Lord will be the complete opposite. You won't feel like a squeamish mouse at the throne of God, but you'll have that boldness and confidence before God all the time, all the time, even in the midst of your problems and your... And your personal shortcomings which God does not acknowledge 
or I should rather say, he has already acknowledged in the cross. So that's why any shortcomings you have right now, they're not an issue with God. Now they may be an issue with other people, but right now I'm just focusing on your relationship with God. And in God's eyes, he just sees you through the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ. There's, and there's no enmity, certainly not. There's only love. In contrast to that, as it says here in this verse, the law only brings enmity, rather. So don't hold the law dear to your heart. Don't think, oh, i got to relate to God. i got to have a personal relationship with Him based on what I'm doing. No, 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 no. <laughs> You know, this is so important because Jesus did away with it, abolish. That's a strong term. You know, when I read that, I think of like dynamite. You know, when you blast up condemned buildings here in the United States, when buildings are no longer of use, they're useless, they're beat up, they're broken down, they're dangerous even. So what do people do? What do uh, builders do? Well, they blast the thing up. They abolish it. They tear it down. And that's what the law does. It tears you down. It makes you feel like you have been condemned. That God isn't living in you, your building. He's left the place. He is long gone. That's what it feels like when you're under the law. That God's way over there. And you're here. Down here in the gutter, in the pit without any help at all. No. See, that's the kind of mentality that the law can bring. And so I'm here to encourage you, steer clear from that kind of mentality. Jesus abolished it, so we should abolish it in our minds, too. Have the same mindset Jesus has. And his mindset is, it's been abolished. This is the Word of God. This is his will. This is his way of thinking. And he's abolished it. So why do we continue to hold it up on our walls like it's living? No, it's dead. It's been buried with him. As it says here in verse 16, So that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. So on the cross, the enmity was put to death. Amen? Praise God. And that's what it also says in Colossians 2.14. And this is a Philip, uh, Philip's translation. It says, Christ has utterly wiped out the damning evidence of broken laws and commandments which always hung over our heads and has completely annulled it by nailing it over his own head on the cross. So when Jesus died, the law died with him. The law is a mean, I should say, the law and its method of relationship with God was done away with. Now, you know, don't, I need to really say here that in Romans 7, it does say the law is good and holy. It's spiritual. And praise God for the law. I know that might sound loopy at this point, but without the law, like I said at the very beginning, you would have never come to your senses and realized you were a sinner in need of a Savior. That is the one really good purpose of the law. So praise God for that, for the law, for that purpose. But other than that, it's been done away with. It is old. It's been abolished in, in the sense that it's an old message. As it says here in Hebrews 7, verses 18 and 19, For on one hand there is an annulling of the former commandment because of its weakness and unprofitableness. For the law made nothing perfect or nobody perfect. So the law would have really liked <laughs> to make you perfect, but it was weak. 
in making you perfect with a spotless conscience, a perfect conscience toward God. And it wasn't because the law is weak, really, as it says elsewhere, but it's because we were weak. You know, we were, were fallen human beings, sinners in need of a Savior. And so when the law came to us, it just, instead of confirming a good conscience toward God, be, because we were sinners, it actually showed us where we were short, where we fell short of God's righteous standard. So, be, you know, because of what Jesus did, it says right there, annulled. The law has been annulled. That's a powerful word too, let alone abolished. You know, annulled means as if it never even happened. Wow. It's a message that we, it shouldn't even cross our radar. It shouldn't even be a blip on our screen. You know, it, it should just be null and void. You know, that's the meaning. That's what these words mean. We have been delivered totally out of a law relationship with God because it's weak. It's not a relate. If you relate to God based on what you're doing, that's a weak relationship. As it says right there, because of its weakness and un unprofitableness. If you want your relationship with God to profit, to walk in the victory that Jesus came to give you, well then don't be law-minded. <laughs> It's pretty black and white, isn't it? The law doesn't make you perfect. It just shows your shortcomings. So that's why our focus is on Jesus. He's perfect. He's spotless. He has everything and is everything we need and we need to be. And we are in Christ. As it says in 1 John 4, 17, one of my favorite verses. You know, just as Jesus is, is just as you are. Well, does Jesus relate to God based on a long list of do's and don'ts? You know, let's just think how Jesus is right now. In his relationship with the Father, do you think they're getting out their pens and their paper and saying, well, you know, the Father says to Jesus, well, you know, you need to do this tomorrow and make sure at noon... Uh, next week on Monday you do this and man I wish you wouldn't mess up and do this again you know no God the Father and Jesus don't have that kind of relationship it's just um, a relationship that's full of acceptance full of high esteem you know it says the Father has given him all glory and uh, honor above all other all others. He's King of Kings and Lord of Lords, right? So that's the same kind of high esteem that God our Father has of us because we're in Christ. Amen. There's no rules and regulations that are in that relationship soup. <laughs> you know, there's not a sprinkle of law going on in there. No, our, our relationship with our Father is only, like I said earlier, only through Jesus. Not through the law, but through Jesus. And everything that Jesus is and everything that Jesus has and the kind of relationship he has with the Father is the same kind of relationship qualities that we have, right? Amen. Amen. You see the contrast? Two totally different covenants. That's why they called the old covenant old. Big rocket science there, right? <laughs> so, again, let's go here to Hebrews 10. Let's just emphasize it again. It says Hebrews 10 verses 9 through 10. This is the New Living Translation. It says... Then he, speaking of Jesus, said, Look, I have come to do your will. He cancels the first covenant. 
in order to put the second into effect. For God's will was for us to be made holy by the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all time. Wow, isn't that beautiful? I just love this. I'm going to read it again. This is just beautiful. Jesus said, look, I've come to do your will. So Jesus did the will. Jesus did the perfect, complete will of God for us. There's nothing left for us to do. As Jesus said in John 6, 29, this is the work of God, that you believe in the one he has sent. Speaking of Jesus. So when you trust in Jesus, by proxy, in a sense, you have done the complete will of God. Jesus did it for you in your place. Amen. And therefore, because he did it all, he did God's will completely on the cross, finished it. He cancels the first covenant in order to put the second covenant, of course, into effect. For God's will was for us to be made holy by the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all time. So you're not made holy by your works by your right behavior or your wrong behavior, you're, praise God, you are made holy by the body, the sacrificial body of Jesus Christ once for all time. Praise God. That is just lovely. That's just, that's the essence of the gospel. So you see the contrast? The law puts the burden on you it's old, it's been abolished, it's annulled, it was nailed to the cross in Christ. Whereas now, we're under a living way with our Heavenly Father. And His name is Jesus. He's alive. He is alive. And He is continually interceding for us. So that at all times, we are always in perfect right standing with our Heavenly Father. And whenever we call out to him in, in the name of Jesus, he said, none of us will be put to shame. None of us will be dismayed. Because we have only his high regard and favor continually shining upon us in Jesus Christ. Amen? Praise God. So I'm, please don't be like the Israelites were, because Paul was very, very, uh, what's challenged, grieved, because his fellow Israelites, as he says here in Romans 10, he says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. What were they doing? In verse 3, it says, For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. So they were all about their own personal righteousness, their own good behavior, being law-minded, definitely. I mean, they were all about the law. And so he was... I mean, you see his heart's desire is that they would come to the correct knowledge of God, which is that righteousness is a gift given by God through Jesus Christ. It's not something you earn by your own behavior. And because they were trusting and not submitting and receiving God's gift of righteousness, they weren't saved yet. So I guess this is a good opportunity here to just put in a little a little blurb about, you know, the fact that everybody's not saved. Just because the Israelites had the holy scriptures and, you know, they had a they were seeking and zealous for the Lord, that doesn't make them saved. Just as many people in this world who think by their own good behavior that they have right standing with God by their own zeal, their own zeal for living right before God. And that does not earn you salvation. Now, everybody 
everybody was included in Christ. Everybody was redeemed or freely forgiven in Christ. That's our message. That's the gospel. We tell people, you've been forgiven freely. You've been, your sins have been paid for. You were included in Christ. Now it's, it's up to the people, though, to believe in that truth and trust in Jesus and become saved. So I just thought I'd mention that since that seems to be kind of a topic nowadays. You know, people think, oh, well, everybody is saved. Everybody's just fine with God. And no, there is, you've got to know and trust that it's only through Jesus that you have right standing with God and, and trust in that truth. He took your, your payment. He paid the awesome cost of your all your sins on the cross. He not only suffered that, but for the curse of the law, he suffered for your healing too. And now when you trust in him completely, you become, as, as it says here in the Bible, saved. You become a new creation in Christ, a child of God. Praise God. So let me continue here. So he's saying, I wish they would submit to the righteousness of God. As it says in verse 4, for Christ is the end of the law. Wow, right there. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Amen. Praise God. Again, so I've really emphasized over and over again that the law has been done away with. It's no longer our measuring stick to have a relationship with God. Praise God, that measuring stick, it's been broken and thrown into the fireplace and burned up to ashes. <laughs> it's gone. It's abolished. It's annulled. You know, there's no spot of it left to even refer back to, praise God. What a, what a relief. You know, you have been set free from that sense of obligation to God. Because that's what the law does. It makes you feel like, oh man, I just didn't do what I should have thought I think I should have done with God. And what I should have done for Him. Or sometimes people make vows to God. God... If you'll just do this, I'll always do such and such and such and such. You know, they put themselves in bondage, so to say, by making a vow to God. If he would just move on their case, move in their case, then he'll help them out. Well, you know what? God has already helped you out freely. He's willing and able, ready to help you out even without your vow. It's freely given, praise God, through Jesus Christ. He is your breakthrough. Not you and what you can do for Him, but He is all in Jesus Christ. Praise God. It's just, that's the abundant favor, the right standing that you have in Him. Amen. So now that you've, you know, hearing this gospel... And as I've taught this before in other places, you know, people hear this and sometimes it shakes them up because they think, well, if I don't have any laws to you know, hold me in a contract, so to say, with God, you know, keep me in line with God, I'm set free from those kind of laws, those, those rules and regulations to check me, you know, make sure that I'm keeping my ducks in a row and what am I going to do if I'm been set free from that well then I'm just I'm probably just going to let it all hang out and just you know some people would say sin like crazy you know what's to stop me now as people may think well I really can't go into real long depth of explanation but we just need to trust that God knows what He's doing, that the law of the Spirit is enough to constrain you. As it says, the, the love of Christ is what constrains me. It says that in the Gospel. So, know that the law 
actually brings sin to life. And, you know, that's right here in 1 Corinthians 15, 56. So again, this goes against your natural, not your spiritual, but your natural inclination. You know, people think, well, if I just remove the laws, then what's going to keep me in the straight and narrow? You know, what's going to keep me in line with God? Well, this takes, praise God, you need trust in the Holy Spirit, trust in the Word of God above your natural understanding. Because this may go against what you may think works in the natural. The Word says here in 1 Corinthians 15, 56, the sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. I mean, take that for what it says right there in black and white. The strength of sin is the law. It's not the gospel. See, the gospel is the message that I've been sharing, that you've been set free, the law has been done away with. It's abolished. It's no longer in the picture. You know, you are set free from that. So, and people think, well, you know, what, what's going to happen now? Well, don't, tr don't go back to trusting the law to keep you in right behavior. Because it says right there, if you do trust in the law, it actually causes sin to come alive, to be strengthened in your life. You know, did you ever play this game when you were a kid? You know, they, you know, they always, the kids would tempt and tease each other saying, Oh, you're a chicken. You can't do that. Even if you tried, you're a loser. There's no way you can do that. So what they're doing when they say those kind of accusatory words, hint, 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 you can't do that. You're a chicken. You know, it's, it's bringing the person down and saying, it's a law. It's saying, you can't do that. That's a law. And what's that cause the, the other, the child, the other person to do usually? I mean, I'd say, well, according to this verse, I'd say 100% of the time. It would cause them to say, oh, yes, I can. I'm going to do it. You just watch me. And they'll just run down the railroad tracks, right straight, heading straight for the, you know, the train. You know, whatever the chicken temptation was. <laughs> but the, the point is, is that that temptation, that challenge, that condemnation that against the other child, you know, the chicken chicken story. It didn't bring out the best in the other child, right? No, it caused them to sin, to tempt. I mean, you know, they were running, you could say that was the, the tempt, temptation, was to run down the railroad track straight for a, a train and see if you could jump out of the way in time. Well, that's not, that's not wise. That's, you know, that, that's not living holy. <laughs> that's being stupid. You know, so when you challenge with the law a person, all it does is it causes sin to rise up and be strong, be strengthened in them. It really does. You know, another example would be like a, in the example of an alcoholic. A lot of times people try and curb their that addiction by saying, you know, through another person and the other person say, you will not drink another drop. You just won't. Just don't ever do that or else. You know, they give them an ultimatum. So in essence, they're laying the law down. Well, in most cases, that just strengthens even, even if they're trying to quit. That ultimatum you know, that law, in essence, that's a law. Don't do this or else. And that actually strengthens that addiction even more in the other person. It's in the freedom that you've been, and knowing the freedom that you've been given in Christ is what truly sets you free. You know, as Jesus said in John 8, 32, he says the truth that you know will set you free. So when you know this truth of the gospel, not of the law, 
but the gospel, they're two totally different messages. And when you know that Jesus has come to make, be friends with you, to accept you, to, high, to hold you in high regard, to be there for whatever you need, whatever help you need, you know, he's your best friend, if, and that's an understatement. I mean, any friends of yours died for you lately? And so, just the, the goodness of the Lord is what leads you to repentance. Right? I think that's in Galatians 5, 6. It's you knowing the goodness that the Lord has towards you is what empowers you to change your mind, to be delivered out of these addictions, these problems, any kind of sin, any kind of unholy living, you know? To live not only that, but to live victoriously, to enjoy the life that He's come to give you, the abundant fruit of the Holy Spirit. You know, righteousness, joy, peace in the Holy Spirit, you know, just when you realize the goodness of the Lord, that's what delivers you from sin, not the law, as these verses say. You know, again, in Romans, this is a commonly, I refer to it frequently, Romans six fourteen. this is the Living Bible. Sin need never again be your master. For now, you are no longer tied to the law where sin enslaves you. But you are free under God's favor and mercy. Isn't that beautiful? I love that, the way that reads in that version. Sin need never again be your master. For now you are no longer tied to the law where sin enslaves you. But you are free under God's favor and mercy. That's a way of saying under God's grace. It's God's grace in Jesus Christ that delivers you from the power of sin. And that's, you know, when you realize and you're, you're flowing and receiving the gift of righteousness, His grace, then sin really has no foothold in your life. It's just a spiritual, supernatural uh, manifestation reality of the spirit. It's a spiritual law that can't be understood with natural comprehension. And that's why I said before that you know, if you think this, that you just need laws to hold you in check, well, you know, that's the natural understanding. I mean, that's what the world does. You know, somebody uh, steals something. Well, what do they do? They don't set them free and teach them about grace and God's mercy. No, they put them in prison, you know. They, they give them the law. So that's natural understanding. It takes the, the Spirit revelation, the Holy Spirit, to open your eyes to see this truth. And you can, if you are willing, just humble yourself. Because people that resist this, they're unwilling to be humble. They're unwilling to be taught and exalt in the truth of the Word. They want to lean on their own opinion. And well, this is how it works in the world. We do this and we do that and that's just how it is. Well, see, that's your own understanding. And when you argue with God with your own understanding versus what the Word says, you're not being humble. You're resisting the ministry of the Holy Spirit, actually. He wants to set you free, but if you're, if you're leaning on your own understanding, you're holding your own self in some kind of bondage because only the Spirit brings liberty and abundant life. And when you are chained to your own little thinking, then you'll have little living. <laughs> in a nutshell. So I encourage you, just don't lean on your own understanding. Lean on what these verses say. These verses say that the law is what will hold you in bondage to sin. And again, even, you know, Romans 7, which is profuse with 
you know, the, how the law does not teach you how to live holy. In verses 7 through 10, this is the New Living Translation. It says, but sin used this command, or you could say the law, sin used it. You know, sin sees an opportunity when the law is used. It's like an open door. When the law is being taught, sin just rushes right through. You know, that's, that's sin. If you wanted to personify sin, you could say sin's running right through that open door where the law is taught. But sin used this command to arouse all kinds of covetous desires within me. If there were no law, sin would not have that power. So Paul says it again right there. I mean, he said it in Romans 6, now he's saying it in Romans 7. He says, if there's no law, sin does not have that power. Sin is powerless when the law is absent. Amen. At one time I lived without understanding the law, but when I learned the command to not covet, that's a law, for instance, the power of sin came to life and I died. So I, and he's talking about spiritually, of course, he's still living, he's writing this, right? <laughs> so he's talking about the, the law, what it does is it brings spiritual death through sin. You know, it causes you to sin and brings, therefore, a, a death in your close relationship with God by the guilty feelings that you would have. So I discovered that the law's commands, which were supposed to bring life, brought spiritual death instead. Well, there you go. Just like I said. Just like he said. Amen. So, you know, trust, trust in the Word. The Word is the Word of God, which endures forever. You know, long after your opinions fade away, the Word will still be around. This is what the Word says. So trust that the Word, that the law will arouse and empower sin to come to life in your life. Be delivered from it. Be convinced that I am no longer under the law, that I am just going to enjoy a rich relationship with my Heavenly Father. Not with rules, but just hearing him speak to me and tell me how he sees me, who I am in Christ, how he's lifted me up and seated me in heavenly places in Christ, far above all principality and power. Praise God, you've been delivered out of all kinds and any kind of oppression. Greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. You know, just basking in what he's done for you. This is being spiritually minded and not law minded and that brings life as it says in Romans 8 6 right to be spiritually minded is life and peace amen so just to recap here to emphasize again that it's the grace of God that leads you into holy living because that was the big challenge a few minutes ago that I brought to mind is, you know, people get concerned and they're worried, well, how am I going to live a holy life then? If I'm set free from the law, how am I going to live a good life then without the law constraining me? Well, in Titus 2, 11 and 12, it says in Amplified Version, for the grace of God, his unmerited favor and blessing has come forward, appeared for the deliverance from sin and the eternal salvation for all mankind. It has trained us to reject and renounce all ungodliness. What's all mean? All. All means all. So the grace of God is what trains you. Or as I said earlier, it's constraining you. It's amazing. It's a spiritual, again, it's a spiritual reality that that is by the, hello, it's by the Spirit. <laughs> That's why it's, it's impossible. It says the flesh can't understand the things of God. It's, they're foolishness. So don't try and understand this by your fleshly thinking. It's a spiritual revelation. 
and, and trust that knowing how you've been set free from obligation to God by the law is what will in fact set you free from sin and it will empower you, like it says here, train you to a renounce all ungodliness and worldly passionate desires to live discreet, temperate, self-controlled, upright, devout, spiritually whole lives in this present world. That is the power of His grace working in your heart. Praise God. He's, it's an easy way too because the grace of God is from God. It's not of your own efforts. It just comes alive, comes to life in your life when you're focused on the right message. Because after all, that's what I'm talking about here, is two different messages. Focus on the grace of God, the mystery of Jesus Christ. What He's done for you in your place. And don't be law-minded. That's the other ministry that is dead and has passed away, has been nullified and annulled and abolished. Be set free from that mentality. Amen? Praise God. Isn't this awesome? This is a huge aspect of the gospel, and I'm just so thrilled to be able to share this with you. It just lights my fire. You know, I, I'm, I get thrilled to see people set free and, and established in the grace of God to to know that God is for them and to see their relationship with God just, just grow in intimacy. You know, you don't, just having a close relationship with God where, you know, He can just sneeze and you hear Him, <laughs> you know? And that happens. I'm not saying you hear God sneeze, so to say. Of course, God doesn't sneeze, right? But the point is, is that you can, you're so in tune with them through hearing the right message that you're, you know, what is a relationship? It's being able to converse and have a conversation and hear what your partner is saying accurately, right? I mean, that's the essence of a good relationship. And when you know God's correct message, which is the gospel and not the law, then you will be tuned in to hear him even better than you've ever heard him before. And that leads to a rich relationship with him. So praise God for Jesus who's done all this for us so that we can just enjoy basking in his presence. You know, just knowing he's always with us. Amen. So I hope you enjoy this. We're encouraged and enlightened, maybe, hopefully, hopefully, <laughs> that's the whole point here, is to grow in our enlightenment of what he's done for us and set on a firm foundation in the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? So thank you for joining me, and I look forward to sharing with you again next time. Have a great week. God bless you. Bye-bye.